Hey guys, I have something a little bit different to say um, today. You know, I read somewhere that people are sort of stuck being in the middle class. The middle class is not what it used to be 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Back then, the middle class was fairly affluent. You could afford things, you could buy luxuries, you could have a very nice standard of living. As capitalism progresses, as it continues, as it evolves, inequality, even in an country, you know, even in a nation like Australia, inequality is just getting further and further apart. So it's just so crucial that we seek out financial literacy, that we seek out also advanced financial understanding, how to get actually get ahead in life. It doesn't mean that you need to earn a million bucks a year. It's just doing the best with what you have. Small steps now can lead to phenomenal gains in the future. In this episode, I'm seeking to give you just that. I've got on mortgage brokers, Hunter Galloway, some great guys, Nathan and Jaden. We talk about the next one year, the next 12 months in property, in lending markets, in finance markets. I know a lot of you will be like, I don't know if this is interesting to me. Concepts like pulling out equity, improving your borrowing capacity, interest rate rises, how much further? And a lot of you guys, other guys, you know, you'll be like, this is super fascinating. It's so important to learn to like this stuff, right? Because when you like it, you can adopt it, you can learn it, and you can get ahead for you and your family. If that's what you're interested in, you know, if that's what you're interested in, then yeah, I really do hope that it brings you a ton of value. Here we go. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name is PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights or dropping ten to $20,000 on buyer's agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence, and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. Let's get into it. First question. I mean, no one has a crystal ball, but you know, everyone has an informed view. And, and you guys have literally, I don't know, I don't want to say out of turn, probably thousands of clients, hundreds of clients, I don't know. But so you're well informed. What do you think is happening with interest rates? Do you think we're in for another two or three years of big hikes? Or are we about to shallow off soon or somewhere in the middle? Definitely. I think we're probably nearing the end of shallowing out like if we look at analysts from both cba westpac anz they've been pretty set in their predictions in that cba said the cash rate will get to 2.6 percent westpac anz on the higher end at 3.35 of 20 economists that were um, surveyed the average is sitting in around that 3.1 so we get a good understanding of where that band is going to be um you know there's going to be some on that lower end that say yeah it's definitely going to get there some on the higher end but we we can probably fairly confidently say we're either going to see another 0.75 increase on where we are, because we're currently at 1.85, or a 1.5% increase. So what does that look like? Well, it's likely we're going to peak later, uh, sometime mid next year is where we'll potentially land. And then once we peak, it's probably unlikely to stay there for long. And um, ComBank has said, quite clearly that they foresee rates will come back down at the end of next year, Westpac ANZ saying early 2023. So I think we'll hit a peak, it'll stay there for a little bit and then come back down. And we've seen this mirror with a lot of the fixed rates. So a lot of the fixed rates have come down recently where they were up in around that six percentile. Now they're coming back down more around the high fours, um, fives. And in the coming months and weeks ahead, we Imagine that this will continue. So um, the forecast probably isn't as dire as what everyone initially thought. And it's looking likely that when we do peak, we might not be there for long. But it is anyone's guess. And we'll only really know in hindsight. Yeah, no, totally. And just as a follow up on this, you know, this week, um, Jerome Powell, the, you know, the Fed chairman over in the US, they had their kind of conference or whatever at Jackson Hole. And he kind of made very um, acute statements to the fact that they're going to do everything they can to tame inflation, almost to the extent of saying, we're going to let the US economy go into recession, but this inflation harnessing, that's our key priority. Like when I read that, when other people read that or hear about that, 
you know, you kind of get it. I won't go as far as to say we get goosebumps, but you kind of get a bit like jittered, right? Like, oh, how, how's that going to affect Australia? In terms of everything you've said right there, like, do you think that the US interest rates are linked in any way to the Australian interest rates, even though in- inflation may tame down in Australia already is so- showing signs of doing that? Do you think that because of what's happening in the US, we're bound to to carry on with our right cycle? Or is it kind of the opposite where if the US sends the world into a recession, the RBA is going to be like, whoa, okay, well, they've done the tough work for us. Let's tame down the, the interest rate rises. Yeah, I think it's it's like the old saying, and, and you remember during the GFC, like in 08, 09, you know, if, if the US sneezes, like the world catches a cold and, and potentially, yeah, like it will have some flow-on effects here. But I think the the unique position with Australia is, in our last two recessions, so like in 08, 09, um, and in 90, uh, 89, 90 or 91, 90, uh, you know, the two last ones, property still did really well, um, as, as an asset class because still, I guess, and you've covered it before, you know, as far as your data and, and what you're looking at, like there's only a finite supply. Australia is pretty small. We've got a growing population. There's calls for migration to increase and you can't really replace it at the moment because of the supply chain issues. So it's one of those things that potentially, yeah. If the US gets tipped into recession, you know, it could come here and it depends on the bank's obviously source of funding and different things, but it doesn't actually necessarily mean a catastrophe for the property markets. Um, it could cause jitters in the share markets. And I guess we've seen that volatility this year as well. Yeah. And I think it's probably common, commonly, uh, well, the consensus could be said that we're not going into an event which is worse than the GFC. And even in the GFC property markets in Australia, I think that's something like 8% on average, they came down around that. Sydney's already down. If you look at the CoreLogic Hedonic Index by about 8%, Sydney's probably going to do worse than the national average, but the av- national average is unlikely to go much beyond 10 or 15% down. And we're already halfway there, to be honest. So um, yeah, there's not that much of a slide. And But nonetheless, you know, Things are going to go down on a national level. There's always good opportunities, but on a national level, they're going to go down. How do people prepare for higher and higher interest rates? Like what, I don't know, sorry to put you on the spot, but like what are like kind of two or three things that they can do right now in terms of the household budgets? Yeah, I think one thing that we're probably seeing a bit more of over the last few years, investors have sort of been looking at, and it's probably more investor specific, but they've been doing principal and interest repayments because the, the interest rates were so low, the difference between that and interest only didn't really make a lot of sense. And um, we are noticing a lot more sort of refinance activity for investors because the banks have sort of, especially post Royal Commission, are completely fine with up to 10 years interest only terms, are fine with potentially 30 year loan terms if it makes sense. Like if there's an exit strategy, if you've got a strong asset base, if you've got a strong job, even if you're over 45. Um, whereas, you know, a couple of years ago, they were getting pretty jittery if you're trying to get interest only terms or if you're refinancing just to that point. Um, so we are seeing a lot of investors restructure and sort of take advantage of that and look at potentially interest only repayments for for sort of cash flow reasons. And even equity, which I know we'll come back to, is a big part to kind of capture that at the moment. Um, what else are you sort of seeing as well? I think they're the main things. And particularly some investors pull out equity and they do like a bit of a debt recycling strategy. So they work with their financial plan or a tax accountant and then set it up so that effectively they pull out more equity so that equity really covers the repayments in the interim and they can focus on their own occupier. So yeah, there's probably um, a little bit more strategy that's at play nowadays, especially in this changing environment. The other thing we've probably seen a lot of is the differential between, I guess, what they call new to bank pricing to sort of back book has almost never been higher. So there's a lot more competition in the mortgage industry than there ever, ever has been. So what usually happens is the banks, and, and we've sort of seen it, and it's also been reflected in borrowing capacity, where the banks are giving new to bank customers a bigger discount off their standard variable rate than ever. So like when I bought my first home um, with one of the big banks, I got a 0.7% discount off their standard variable rate. And that was like, wow, you're getting almost a percent off the standard variable rate. That's, That's like crazy. thousands of dollars, right? Yeah. These days you're getting, like if you've got a 20% deposit, a 2.5% discount off the standard variable rate with some of the banks. So it's almost it's like three, more than three times what it yeah. was 10 years ago. So there's definitely a bit more of that where, you know, if, if cash flow and people are sort of concerned about that, we're potentially having a look around and seeing what else is available can, can help alleviate some of that. That's a really good call out. And I think sometimes people are a bit nervous to to kind of investigate what banks are happy to offer, but like seriously, like you guys know this, right? It's, it's not hard. You just have to pick up the phone and say, look, not so happy with my current rate. 
this other bank, call it Westpac, CBA or whatever, are happy to give me X rate. You can even just make up a number and then they'll, they'll bring it down. And then you can say, I'm still not happy with that number. Can you send me a discharge notice? And then they'll talk to their supervisor and get it even further down. So that's a really good, good call out. And Nathan, you mentioned debt recycling and, and equity. Like that might go over like people's heads. I know when I was starting out in property investing, I was like, man, this debt recycling, like let's not talk about funky stuff like that. But what, what does that mean? Like pulling out equity, what does it mean? And, and how do you like practically do it. You know, you're a mortgage broker, so you've probably done it millions of times, but how does it happen? Definitely. So I think this is general in nature. So definitely get advice from your accountants and financial planners. But practically speaking, in the most simplistic way, it's effectively pulling out um, equity from an investment property. And then that equity effectively um, pays for itself. So the interest that you'd otherwise be getting charged on that loan gets eaten away on that equity. So then the cash flow that you'd otherwise be putting into that investment loan, let's say it's a thousand bucks a month, you can now put that into your own Rocky Pie. So you're effectively increasing your limit. On that limit, you allow the interest to eat into it. So you still get a tax sort of incentive there. Um, but then you effectively don't have to worry about that liability. Yeah. So I think even at its most simplistic, and this is where a lot of people, I guess, if you take it from the very, very beginning, equity is a difference between what you owe on your loan and the property's value. But you can look at equity in two ways. If you sell a property, if your property is worth 500,000, if you've got a loan of 400,000, you have $100,000 in equity if you sell. But if you're looking at a bank loan, they'll only lend up to 80% or 90% potentially of that $500,000 value. So 80% of 500 um, is what? 400. 400. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's 100. Yeah. There's no equity available there. But you know, if you go to 90, percent you can go to 450. Yeah. There's 50 thousand dollars you can pull off the table. And like Nathan said, you pull that 50 out, put it towards an investment, and that can be the deposit for the next place along. Sure, sure. And there's some some funky things that sometimes people do where they refinance their principal place of residence, which is bad debt, non-deductible debt, and they refinance that and then use that equity in their PPOR as an as a deposit for an investment and so even though the equity is tied to their principal place of residence it becomes good debt it becomes deductible debt so obviously none of this is financial advice but there's so much stuff that you can do with equity and you know these days it's like oh i only have twenty thousand dollars i only have forty thousand dollars i can't buy my first prop my second property my third property you might actually be able to do it you can just harness the power of of equity and, you know, get in touch with the guys, obviously, to, to learn more. I think one question that's kind of on everyone's minds is, and it's, I think you guys are uniquely placed to answer this. Are people actually struggling to pay their mortgages? You know, interest rates are rising. You hear in channel seven, channel nine, news.com, you know, all the media is, you know, picking out stories of people who are like having to sell their homes. You know, obviously that's what the media does, but. Yeah, and be honest, like, is that what you're seeing amongst your clientele? Are there, is there more mortgage stress than when interest rates were 1% lower or 1.5% lower? Or even if they go up another 1% or 2%, the official cash rate that is, based on what you're seeing amongst your own clientele and your own book, is that going to cause a lot of stress for folks? Uh, so far, we haven't seen any sort of indications on that. And even with some of the banks, uh, like annual reports that came out, their arrears rates are still under 1%, which is historically really, 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 really low. Um, so there's definitely not been any signs of that. Yeah, I think some of those stories and even some of the data from other um, people online can be really small subsets. So that it, they might interview, you know, a thousand people in Western Sydney and it, like it might be accurate for that area, but like it's not a national thing. And, you know, you even talk about with data, yeah. you can't compare a suburb of West of Perth to, you know, North of Brisbane or something like that. So, so definitely from our own data, we're not seeing anything to indicate that, um, you know, people are sort of struggling in arrears. And certainly like when we did see it was, you know, when COVID hit and we had, you know, applications in flight where, uh, people just got made redundant overnight and, and, you know, they were forced to leave their jobs. Chefs weren't, didn't have work, people in the aircraft industry, you know, pilots. And, and that's where we saw, you know, people over the short term had, had some cash issues because they were there and then JobKeeper kicked in, sort of helped out that. And then they're all back in jobs and now unemployment's at like a historically low level. So I think with all those factors in there and then while unemployment's still where it's at, people still have work. There's still wage pressure as well. Um, and then, like I said earlier, there's still potential for them to sort of open up international rivals to, to sort of put more people in yeah. jobs. 
And even of the clients we've helped, like usually we do an annual review or every couple of years of a re review, what we do see, so we're not seeing any issues from a mortgage repayment ability. We're seeing they have decent buffers and those that when we do a reassessment, they might be going, Nathan, I want to think about an investment property. A large percentage of them have actually had pay increases. And, you know, um, we've seen unemployment at record lows. These people are qualified. They've got um, their sales in good positions where they're actually worthy in the marketplace and they're getting rewarded for it. So we've actually probably seen quite the opposite, not as much doom and gloom out there. If anything, it's probably business as usual. Yeah. And, and that's so kind of like, it's so relieving to hear, but it's also somewhat unsurprising because we are at full employment, wages are going up. I was talking to folks at CBA and they were saying that the lion's share of over leveraged debt, you know, where debt is, um, LVR is beyond 85, 90, 95%. The majority of people who have a lot of debt disproportionately are people with higher incomes. That's the reality of how that distribution curve looks like in Australia at the moment. And so if you're on a higher income, even if your income goes down a little bit or you lose your job, you've got a lot of savings to tap into. It's more that end of the market that's really being affected. Even these numbers that are coming out of Sydney, you know, it's dropping every month. This is not, you know, Western Sydney that's dropping. It's not Penrith or Parramatta that's going down. It's the more premium parts of say, East Sydney and, and the lower North Shore. So you kind of really have to understand and that, you know, looking at the data and, and anecdotally is is really good to hear from you guys because you're kind of in the coal face. And around borrowing capacity, I just want to ask you this question. One of the reasons why the property market on average, not everywhere, but on average is kind of shallowing out. It's not because people are forced to sell, but rather borrowing capacity is being tightened because interest rates are rising. Like it makes sense. Higher interest rates, higher repayments, bank will give you less to as a loan. So that is one reason why property markets are just sliding off a little bit. Definitely not the case in Perth, definitely not the case in Adelaide, some parts of regional Australia. But I just want to ask you the question, and I always get asked this, I'm sure a lot of listeners and viewers will be thankful, how do we improve our borrowing capacity? It's always like the the, the pain in the a bum when you know, you're know you like so addicted to property investing, but you can't get that next loan. Um, what are some tips that maybe in your own portfolios you guys have utilized or for clients? Definitely. I think there's a few things you can do. Firstly, I think taking a step back with those rate rises you mentioned earlier, um, for every half a percent increase on, um, you know, the Reserve Bank makes, your borrowing power is going to reduce by about 5%. So you can put it in real numbers for every rate rise we've had recently. Um, you know, you've lost about 15 to 20% in your capacity from what you could get before we started in the start of the year. Um, really simple ways to increase borrowing power. The first is if you tapped out with your major lenders, most people have, you know, one or two investment properties, whether it be with your major banks, ANZ, Westpac, um, NAB, CBA, or you might be with St. George, one of the second tiers. The easiest way to increase your capacity is looking at a non-conforming lender. So there's a bunch of lenders, Liberty, Bluestone, Pepper, and typically they'll give up to two to $300,000 more on borrowing power without changing a thing. So that's just not even looking at any changes to credit cards or any of that fun stuff that you probably have heard of before. It's purely looking at a non-conforming lender where they have different assessments. They'll usually take the actual repayment. So if you're paying interest only, they'll they'll shade it. They won't add any shading. Um, they'll they won't buffer rental income and a bunch of stuff like that. And more importantly, yes, you do pay a slightly higher interest rate. However, there's been a bunch of lenders that have recently come out who've done a, a simplified refinance process, which effectively is the bank will refinance your loan without looking at your income, without looking at your position, without looking at anything, as long as they can see that your loan amount staying the same, the interest rate is that you're getting with them is lower than the rate you're currently on, and that you confirm your financial circumstances ha haven't deteriorated from when you initially got your loan with like a pepper or bluestone. So these non-conforming lenders are a terrific short-term solution because you can refinance out of them now because of the bank's simplified methodology. That's amazing. So you're saying that there's products out there where even though the lenders are, are non-conforming, they're not giving, a, they're not charging you a higher interest rate as opposed to the big four banks. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, so you'd go with, let's say, a Liberty um, to begin with, and there'll be a higher interest rate to start with but you stay with them for six months. And then after six months, you can refinance to a like a conforming lender who has a simplified 
refinance process where they're actually not assessing your application. So you pay a slightly higher rate for a short term, but then after that, you can refinance under that new refinance option, which the bank isn't actually doing an assessment on your income yes. and you can get big bank rates. So you effectively, it will help increase your borrowing power by that much. And then when you refinance under that simplify methodology, the banks aren't actually assessing your position because you've demonstrated that you've been able to pay your mortgage for the last six months, albeit with a non-conforming lender with a higher rate, um, but then move across and off you go. That's a terrific tip. It's almost like you know, you don't have the keys to the house. You go and climb at the window at the back, and then you've kind of seen inside what the house looks like. You found the key and you open it up from the the front door. That's that's a, and uh, you know, when I hear or when people hear words like non-conforming lender, like that sounds illegal and ominous and like non-conforming. You know what I mean? Like, is there any additional risk of going with a tier two, tier three lender as opposed to the ones that everyone knows about, CBA, Westpac, etc.? It's more that they're not regulated by the bank. I think it's by APRA, um, by the bank's regulators. So with the banks, they have to add uh, like a, a 3% buffer to the current rate. So they're assessing you at like, you know, 7% or whatever it might be now. If you've got interest only for five years, instead of assessing it over 30 years repayments, they'll do it over 25 years. So then your payments are, you know, quite a lot higher. Um, you know, with some of the banks, if you've got more than uh, two investment properties, they'll look at sort of the actual expenses and you might have had, uh, you know, like a, a big, you might have fixed up the fence or something and spent a bunch of money on your property last year. You might have spent $10,000 on there. They'll take that off your total gross rental. So it's going to reduce your borrowing capacity. So there's all this sort of stuff that the banks are regulated and bound by. Whereas like Nathan said, the Peppers, um, Bluestone, that sort of thing aren't regulated by the same rules because they get their money from wholesale markets, not from deposit takers. Um, so, so yeah, I guess the risk is potentially if those markets change, potentially they might increase their interest rates more than the banks um, is probably the big risk. But other than that, they still have to be, they're not predatory, I guess, yeah. like you know, guys with baseball bats coming to your property. Yeah, you're not prey for them. And what's really interesting is that net interest margins or the margins that the banks are making have been shrinking as their cost of debt or their cost of capital is increasing with overseas money markets. And so there, there's like real competition between the banks right now. And I think like you've, you mentioned it before as well, but it's like, don't rest on your laurels. If, if you want a lower rate, it's probably out there. If you've tapped out a borrowing capacity, you can probably get it, but you just have to kind of pivot and see which other bank is, is going to be your friend. No, that's great advice. Is there anything else that you want to say um, about the current property market or how you're seeing things about interest rates or anything at all? Yeah, I think like the other thing that we probably see with mistakes, like especially if you're starting out, you might have a home, you might be trying to get an investment property, is getting things structured right. So mm -hmm. probably to your equity point before, one common mistake we see is when people have their, their properties sort of crossed together. So you might have a home, you might have an investment property, and the bank ties them together. So then, you know, when you go and get equity out in a year's time, instead of just valuing this one, which has gone up in value, and this one that's gone down in value separately, they have to value them both, and it kind of brings down the equity available. So, um, yeah, I think like the, the with that sort of stuff, you just want to make sure you get the structure right. You want to do a review. It's kind of like your health. Like it's worth doing a checkup every every now and again. You know, to make sure, like you said, you're not getting you in the best deal. No, amazing. I mean, this is so insightful. And I think especially for investors or even homeowners who are, you know, just tapping or just kind of dipping their toe into the property market, what you guys have said, the, the advice that you've given is like stuff that you don't really get very easily anywhere else. So I really appreciate you coming on and, and helping out Jaden and, and Nathan from Hunter Galloway. Where, where can people find you? Definitely. Look, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Hunter Galloway um, Mortgage Brokers Australia, or visit our website, huntergalloway.com.au. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for, for coming on, guys. And yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Thanks mate.